termómetro global por la recuperación de los mundiales de la empresa 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 de la So, um, hello and welcome to the first Global Just Recovery Gathering panel. It's aptly titled Just Recovery for All to kick off this momentous event. Uh, my name is Agnes Hall. I'm the Global Campaigns Director at 350 and it's a real honour to speak with such incredible global thinkers today. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, before we get to, down to it, I want to introduce our highly prestigious panel. We have Hakima Abbas in, in Kenya. She is the co-executive director of AWID, which is the Association for Women's Rights and Development, if you didn't know. She's a global feminist movement, that's a global feminist movement support and membership organization. She is also in the leadership of the Global Black Feminist Fund. We also have Amitav Ghosh joining from New York. He is an award-winning writer who holds two lifetime achievement awards and four honorary doctorates, which is pretty impressive to say the least. In 2019, Foreign Policy magazine named him as one of the most important global thinkers of the preceding decade. We also have Naomi Klein joining from Canada. I feel she needs little introduction, um, but just to say she is an award-winning journalist and New York Times best-selling author. We also have Dominique Palmer joining us from the UK. Dominique is an organizer within Fridays for Future International and is the launch coordinator for Climate Life. She is featured on the Forbes 100 leading UK environmentalist list for her work. So thank you so much again for being here today. Honestly, when the 350 team um, asked me to moderate this panel, I was overjoyed. It, it's a real honor. So let's get down to our conversation um, about a just recovery. Um, so to preface that, this last year has been a truly difficult year for people around the world. In the face of a deadly virus, we've had to start staying at home. We can no longer able to organize in the way that we used to in movements. And many of us couldn't even see our loved ones. So today we're gonna to be discussing what a just recovery looks like, not only taking into account the COVID crisis, but also thinking, how can we use this opportunity to think about a recovery that encompasses health, economic and climate crises that are all so interlinked, as we know. So let's get started. Um, Naomi, I wanted to um, turn to you and, and say, I've, I've just read your book, How to Change Everything, which is a really thoughtful book about how young people can take action on climate change. How do you think this moment of the global pandemic has changed the work that movements need to do? And, and how do you think it changes our asks to government? Sure, it's just, first I just wanna say what a pleasure it is to, to be on this amazing panel. And I can't wait to, to hear from these brilliant thinkers and doers. Um, and yeah, it's such a huge question. Um, but I think, I guess where my mind goes for this question is um, something that the um, science fiction writer Kim Stanley Robinson uh, wrote early on in the pandemic, which was that we're so off script right now that one has the sense that we're writing a science fiction novel together. <laughs> um, and I think that there's something really hopefully liberating about that in the sense that um, we are like things have changed so quickly, um, not in the ways that we would have wanted, but we um, all now on this planet have this bodily experience of rapid transformation. And so, you know, I, I think as we all know, a lot of what we're up against when we when we call for change on the scale that our interlocking and intersecting crises demands, the biggest thing we're up against is not what we were up against five years ago, which was like an, uh, an argument like, no, we can solve this with technical fixes. You know, it's, it's just doomism. It's just, we can't, it's too big. You know, like the global economy is moving too fast. It's just not possible. And so what I hope we can do maybe is hold on to this experience of how quickly um, things did change. And not to say that they all changed in the right ways or the ways that we would have wanted, 
but we have seen massive changes in our societies and in our individual lives. And to then say, okay, how do we design change now? How do we, um, because we obviously need, um, we need economic stimulus, um, we need large scale action. Um, this is now being recognized by a lot of neoliberal economists. So what should that look like? And I think COVID has been an amazing kind of diagnostic tool in just showing us everything that is broken, everyone who is being excluded, whatever injustice, whatever inequality preexisted COVID was exacerbated by it. Whoever was being treated as disposable uh, before COVID was treated as sacrificial during it. Um, and so a just recovery heals this. It starts from those, from, from what COVID revealed and, and says, okay, what message has that sent us? Yeah, and I think your point about um, having seen such rapid change over the last year is 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 totally right. We've seen large scale change, and we and we also know that that things can continue to change um, and quickly. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Um, I'm delighted to have uh, Dominique join us today, and I would be really interested, Dominique, to hear from from you as as a young person. Um, what kind of change you think is required, particularly for young people? So I know that you've said before, young people will be particularly affected by the internet interconnected health, economic and climate crisis. But how do you see that happening in the world? And, and what do you think needs to be done to support young people? Yes. So, well, first of all, it is a pleasure to be on this panel with such in incredible um, people. And as a young person, there is so much that we're calling for to support us and our future this crisis and we can already see the interconnected issues of the crisis taking place especially um, for certain communities including young people across the world and as the crisis worsens this threat for our generation increases and when it comes to interconnected issues such as health for example i lived and grew up in one of the most polluted areas in london and the inequality there is really obvious, especially across the UK, as most communities of colour are most likely to live in these areas that are most polluted. And so the very air that we breathe is being threatened. And this will be exacerbated for my generation and the next by this crisis. Air pollution is just one factor that significantly affects health and is so interconnected to this crisis. This crisis threatens our lives, water, livelihoods, which are already, dis already being disproportionately their already communities being disproportionately impacted by this and those marginalized and those um, in poverty, for example. And we, we know how the crisis also causes harm in the form of disasters as well. And this causes climate refugees and puts people in vulnerable situations as well. And how viruses increase in frequency as the climate continues, all of these different interconnected issues will be exacerbated if we continue to have inaction on the climate crisis. And even the impact on our mental health, which really isn't discussed as much, this threat unsurprisingly has significant psychological impacts and one of those being eco-anxiety that a lot of young people are facing today. And so from a like socio-economic and like justice perspective, workers and marginalized communities could be left behind and left in the most vulnerable positions and so we need to have a just transition that protects people and the planet and as young people we are calling for concrete climate action plans that include and account for climate and environmental justice and so the future that i see um where my generation and the next are protected is one that has environmental, true environmental justice at the heart of it. And so that requires that all people deserve the right to a healthy environment, including the provision of clean air, land, water, and food. And so we must have equity in our solutions because without it, we have no solid foundations to build on. And so policy must be based on climate justice that addresses the interconnected aspects of the crisis and seeks to eliminate social and economic equality alongside it. For the future, we really need to decarbonize in a way that protects us, protects marginalized communities and protects workers and that places the well-being of people and our natural world at the heart of it. To stop endless ecological destruction for profit, young people need to be included in the decision making in these spaces and able to engage. We need climate reparations for those who are most responsible for climate breakdown and to support those who have been wronged. We need 
legislation where governments and corporations, for example, can be tried for environmental destruction and held accountable. Indigenous communities and native peoples must have their rights protected and their practices respected because this is key to protecting our biodiversity. And this is also one thing we're calling for, especially in the UK with our Teach the Future campaign. We need education for present and future generations that really teach the reality of the crisis, as well as centering social and environmental issues that are interlinked with this. Yeah, that's fantastic, um, Dominique. Thank you so much. And what you're talking about, about the need for inclusion, you know, we need the climate crisis needs everyone to help solve it. And we need young people. We need, of course, people from marginalised and frontline communities. Um, and we need to have a really inclusive climate movement that puts compelling solutions on the table. Um, Amitav, I wanted to um, turn to you and say, I think one of the things that we actually struggle with or we can struggle with is when we're painting, trying to paint a clear picture of an alternative world. So something different to the one that we live in now, it's hard to really capture public imagination in, in that truly inclusive and, and broad brush way as something we can work towards together. And, and I just wanted to ask you as a renowned author and an amazing writer, do you have any thoughts or tips for people watching today on how we could best visualize and communicate what a just recovery could look like um, and what that world could look like and you know what our pathway to that world could be? Well, uh, let me say, first of all, uh, what a pleasure it is to be uh, on this panel with all of you. I mean, it's just so interesting to listen, uh, just listening to what you what you're saying. And I think it's so important for everything that Dominique said, you know. <clears throat> you know, I think imagining an alternative uh, is very difficult in many ways, simply because, as Naomi pointed out, uh, there have been, um, you know, I mean, uh, we seem to be sort of trapped within this kind of uh, acceleration. But uh, two things I would want to say there. You know, one of the lessons of this time is that activism works. Uh, uh, you know, if you think about it, uh, Bolsonaro did, is, has done and is doing everything possible to undo, really to turn uh, the Amazon into a kind of new Midwest, uh, you know, just filled with monocultures and, uh, uh, you know, cattle farming and so on. And yet he hasn't been able to do that, you know, partly because uh, Brazil has a good regulatory structure left in place since the 80s by various left-wing governments and because there are a lot of Brazilian activists. Uh, similarly, in the US, uh, you know, Trump tried to uh, undo a lot of regulation and he wasn't actually able to. Uh, you know, 350.org uh, has actually played a large part in this, you know, by, uh, by preventing companies and investors from uh, getting into the opportunities that Trump was trying to open up for them. So I think those are important lessons to remember, you know. The, Really important thing, though, is actually, I mean, at this moment, it's so incumbent upon all of us to try and imagine alternatives, you know, just alternative ways of living. You know, I mean, that's really the challenge. And there again, I would say the activism of the last, uh, you know, eight to 10 years, of, um, you know, has been very inspiring to me in many ways. And for this, I give, entirely give the credit to uh, young people, you know, uh, say just visiting, um, all the Occupy sites, and I visited many Occupy sites around 2012, you know, what they were trying to do was to perform another kind of life, you know, living in shacks, sharing meals, creating sorts of uh, all sorts of protocols for interaction with each other, you know. And similarly, uh, you know, I've only read about the No DAPL movement. I know that Naomi has been there, spent a lot of time with them. I think one of the really interesting things that they were trying to do was to demonstrate a different way of living. So it wasn't just a protest in the normal sense. I mean, they were performing something, you know, the, they were performing a different way of life. And I think I see this with a lot of protests, you know, I mean, with XR, uh, with writers rebel and so on. Uh, there's a performative aspect to it in which they're trying to, as it were, imagine uh, different ways of living. Yeah, that's really interesting and 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 helpful, and I think um, nourishing food for thought when we're thinking about uh, what a just recovery in a new world could look like. Um, that activism is really inspiring and it is really hopeful, and you know that is happening all over the world. Um, and actually, we need action on all kinds of different issues in order to kind of lead to a just recovery. 
all strands of justice are needed, all kinds of action are needed. And I heard someone say the other day, I, I really liked that we need to try and take action to usher in new kinds of justice at the moment. And so that does require um, imagination and, and thinking in that creative uh, uh, way and envisaging that. Um, Hakima, I wanted to, to ask you, when we're thinking about all these different kinds of justice that are required, you know, obviously a really important area is women's rights and, and gender justice. Do you think that women's rights have been pushed to the side or uplifted in conversations about recovery? Um, and is there anything you think we can do to better platform and support women's rights as part of our campaigning for, for a just recovery? Thanks so much, Aggie, for the question. I mean, I'd like to start by uplifting the names of Fikilit, Sangazi, Tulin, Glovo, Anna Marie Chai, Lemita Evangelista, Maritza Kiroz Leva, and the many other women who've died defending land and territory and the earth. And I really start there because I think it's important for us to remember that this struggle isn't being waged in abstraction. People are really paying with their lives, particularly Black, Indigenous women and queer workers. Um, and so I know that a just recovery requires a deep reckoning. We don't just have to recover as we know from a pandemic. We have to recover from essentially the largest ever global wealth heist by the 1%. We have to recover from patriarchy that hasn't only wreaked violence on women, trans and non-binary people, but it's also created methods of governance and systems of labor and practices of relationship that are coercive. And so for me, a just recovery is following the lead of women farmers in West Africa who use their solidarity networks for mutual aid during the pandemic, sending each other seeds that they had saved. These women claim that nous sommes la solution, we are the solution because they're using and constantly innovating agroecological farming methods that can save our planet from the disaster that industrial agriculture is reaping. So in terms of women in the conversation of the recovery, we've been organizing around the idea of a feminist economic recovery, because as we know, all around the world, those most deeply impacted by crises are impoverished women, trans and non-binary people. So a feminist economic recovery is about kind of shifting the political subjectivity at the center of the demand for a just recovery. And what that does is change the demand itself. Like during this pandemic, I think we've all seen um, the centrality of care in, for thriving societies it, and how strongly our societies depend on care work. And during the pandemic, we've seen that the care burden has sharply increased on women. So if we can imagine an economy that centers around care rather than around production, it would be a completely different logic to the economy and would be transformative in so many ways, socially, politically, culturally. So a feminist economic recovery demands things like public universal care systems and demands that we redefine wealth as a community asset that's created through our collective unpaid and paid labor. And certainly there just needs to be much more attention around the ways in which um, gendered impacts of our multiple crises are happening. Um, one of the examples again is around debt cancellation. I li I'm live in I'm from Africa, and of course, the odious debt has systematically depleted state capacity in Africa to fund adequate public services. And that has a disproportionate impact and burden on women in societies. And so we need to put debt cancellation, tax justice, and beyond that reparations, which Dominique mentioned, to restructure our economies and eventually to reverse the harm of wealth extraction and privatization. Thank you so much for that, Hakima. And I love what you're saying about the centrality of care over production um, and how that's you know, been important and needs to be made more of. Um, so, you know, we've been talking a bit about solutions so far and about what's needed, and it's been so great to hear your insights on that. Um, but doing a bit of a pivot from real solutions for a just recovery, 
I wanted to hear what you think about false solutions. Um, so personally, for me, misinformation is something that really gets to me on a, on a deep level. And um, I campaign on, on combating misinformation in my spare time. Um, but there, of course, there's so many false solutions out there. Um, Naomi, what, what threat do you think that greenwashing and, and false solutions pose to us uh, in this moment? I would prefer to think about it as almost like a challenge to us, um, as opposed to a threat in the sense that they are a threat and they always have been, um, but they are a greater threat when our movements fail to be as ambitious um, uh, and taking up as much space as we need to take up um, and putting our solutions on the agenda and connecting with people and building them in miniature, as Amitav said, um, but also, you know, larger than, than, in, than, than a protest camp, but also, you know, in, in cities, um, at the subnational level, in communities, so that people can really live the, the, the fact that what a just transition means is that responding to, 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 to the climate crisis is not going to just be better than a future of apocalyptic breakdown that you saw in a sci-fi movie. It's better than Tuesday. You know, it's 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 tangibly improving daily life with things like you know free public transit and green, uh, beautiful uh, community-based public housing or affordable housing that, on a commons model. And so giving people the experiences to say, you don't have to be afraid of this, right? Because we've been up against these talking points from the fossil fuel industry for so long that have told people, if we act on climate, you will lose your job, your life will be terrible. So we need to give people those experiences and we have this opening, this opportunity. If we fail, then the planet hackers and the, you know, all of the techno solutions and the Bill Gates model enters into the people's fear and panic and says, we have the magic bullet, right? But I actually don't believe that hacking the sun is a more appealing solution than community, you know, energy democracy, public housing um, solutions, you know, a, a real uh, um, indigenous led youth climate core that's going to plant billions of trees and give land back to indigenous people. I mean, this is a beautiful future we're talking about, right? This is better than the present. And so, yeah, those, those threats are real, but I feel like they get their energy from our failure, you know, from our lack of ambition, um, because actually what they're proposing is dismal and terrifying to, 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 to anybody with, you know, with any kind of forethought. People don't really want to dim the sun. <laughs> That's a terrible, terrible vision. Um, so yeah, and I mean, I think we're picking up on what, what Hakima said, I think it's really important that we say, yes, we in this moment where people are finally recognizing the centrality of care work, we need to also say, hey, that's low carbon work. You know, um, like a green job isn't just a guy putting up a solar panel. It isn't just the idea that we get to have the exact same high consumer lives only we're getting our energy from, from, from you know, so-called so green sources. It means that we are valuing different things and living differently and living more potentially happier, more beautiful lives to pick up on, on Dominique's point about the mental health crisis. This system is failing people. People are not happy, you know? And I think in this moment when we have a very, vivid memory of what we did and did not miss during this period. We, 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 we can't let this slip away as normal comes roaring back, quote unquote normal, right? Because people didn't miss shopping, they missed each other, they missed gatherings, you know, they missed celebrating together. And, and, and you know, the future we're talking about actually gives people so much that we've missed most and so, yeah, I feel like we have honestly a short window where we, well, before that runaway train called normal comes slamming back into our lives um, to, to just hold on to the, the teachings, the learnings of this really, really hard year, right? Yeah, I mean, I love that, that the train of the train of normal comes barging in um, and that is you know, very likely to happen soon. Um, 
But I hear what you're saying about also about these half-baked compromises and solutions um, that, you know, just do we really want those? No. Um, and Amitav, I know that you've said before, because I did my research, <laughs> that the West has come to rely on what you call an expert discourse from scientists and that the result is the West puts its hope in business friendly, sustainable development, which can include a lot of false solutions. So I guess uh, same question to you. What what challenge do you think false solutions particularly pose to, to us and, and the climate movement um, and other movements at, at this time? <laughs> You know, I really think it's been a problem uh, uh, for the climate discourse as such that it comes out of such a narrow, uh, narrow sphere. You know, I mean, almost everything that's written out of about climate comes out of Western uh, um, academies, think tanks. Uh, you know, within the discourse, really, there is so few. Um, uh, you know, Indian, Asian, African. Uh, voices, so few voices that are heard. Uh, you know, it's. I, I think it's a genuinely a disaster. You know, for the climate movement as such, because why is the voice of the woman who has to walk uh, five miles to fetch water and then ten miles to fetch water, why is that voice not heard more clearly? Why is it always reduced to various kinds of numbers and uh, uh, you know various equations and this and that? And I think, you know, the very fact that the whole discourse has come to be surrounded with such a sort of air of expertise, uh, you know, has actually a very intimidating effect. It keeps people out. It keeps uh, young people out. It keeps a, a lot of uh, uh, people who don't have access to that kind of expertise. It keeps them out of the whole discourse. So I do feel that it's a very, very important thing to broaden this discourse, to bring in other voices, to bring in uh, what, what, uh, a grassroots perspective. <laughs> you know, after all, um, Asian and African uh, farmers and fishermen have known for a long time, you know, that the climate is changing in disastrous ways, and uh, some of them have been able to adapt. But it's not. It's not a surprise to them, you know. So it's very, very important to in, uh, to reintegrate these voices, you know, uh, within the discourse. Because one of the reasons why this uh, entire discourse is so easy for governments to ignore is simply because uh, you know it doesn't mobilize a, a, a large number of people. But even there, you know, one of the sort of really false solutions, I would say, uh, you know, I think India is a very good example of this you know, of just constant greenwashing, you know, just, I mean, what can I say? I mean, the waterfalls of greenwashing rhetoric, you know, comes out of the government. And at the same time, in the most underhand way, they've, they've really dismantled uh, the regulatory structures. You know, I mean, they've, uh, for at least, uh, you know, previous governments had some common sense and didn't allow building within a uh, hundred meters of the shoreline. Slowly but steadily, this government has, has whittled away at it. And, you know, Un and, uh, you know, the government keeps getting sort of kudos from foreign agencies, from the UN. It's unbelievable to me, honestly. And, you know, look what they're doing. They're locking up young uh, climate activists like Disha Ravi. I'm sure you saw that, you know. So, you know, we really have to keep in mind that, uh, uh, you know, this greenwashing is a real danger. Aggie, could I add something to what I'm Please. Saying? Please, I was just going to invite you and Dominique to, to please do feel free to build. Just because I really want to build on what you just said, Amitav, around the, the fact that the solutions have always been also there and that our, those of us in the Global South really have um, many of those solutions. I mentioned the women farmers in West Africa. Um, and I think, I don't know, do you, you all remember Tina, the, the Margaret Thatcher, there is no alternative to capitalism and all of those things. But I live in a context in Africa where 80% of jobs in urban contexts are in the informal economy. 90% of women rely on the so-called informal economy, but which we call the people's economy. And it's not the dominant economy because, um, and the dominant economy is propped up by a few people who are making obscene amounts of money and wealth um, up to holding this very colonial IMF imposed privatize and monetize everything kind of economy. 
Um, but when you're talking about nearly everyone being traders and somehow engaged in another market, another economy, can you really say that there's no alternative? Uh, we live this alternative every day, not least because if we didn't, we wouldn't survive the, the dominant economy. And the people's economy has its own logic, a logic that kind of brings closer the social, the cultural, political logic of the communities that are involved. And even though that's not always liberatory or necessarily liberatory, there's important seeds of what can blossom in the ways that mutual aid, solidarity, cooperation show up in that kind of economy. So I feel like we need a people's funeral for Tina. Um, we need to really squash the myth of that inevitability and pervasiveness of neoliberal capitalism. And I think our culture workers, as Amitav said earlier, can really help us write our realities into the history books and help us to keep dreaming our freedom practice. There was um, um, a writer, Tony Cade Bambara, who's an African culture worker in the US, who said, my job is to make revolution irresistible. And I think that's, that's really what places such centrality in cultural workers in many of our contexts. Definitely, um, what's been said. And I wanted to add on there to what Amita have said as well about the kind of um, the movement right now and also the expertise um, element of it that kind of keeps people out of it. And I find that a lot of the time, it almost like a gate keeps people um, from coming into the movement. It makes them feel as if they have nothing to offer. When in reality, for a just recovery, it is so essential that we have the perspectives from all of these people. And yet that's being stopped because those um, in power who want to keep this system want it to stay like that. They don't want these kind of new perspectives to come in. They don't want that radical uh, thought process to happen and they don't want change to happen. And so building up this grassroots movement is so crucial so that we have those different perspectives when it comes to solutions and when it comes to a just recovery. And I often find that these kind of false solutions is they're always staying um, within the narrow like Western boxes as has been mentioned. And it's so ridiculous to even consider that we can solve this crisis the same way that we got into it. For a just recovery, we have to completely reshape this and greenwashing to me, is just, it's straight up lying. It's just complete deceiving. And we've, that is one of our biggest challenges that we really have to get over because one of the ways that we're going to even push um, for a just recovery is by having mobilization, is by having more people and is by having those perspectives um, from a grassroots movement. And to mobilize people, we have to tap into the potential that's there. We have to tap into the fact that people care but aren't quite there yet people don't know about the interconnected aspects of the crisis and people are falling into the greenwashing and the lies that's being fed to them and so it's really crucial in that way that when we focus on like our movements and mobilization that we're really really pushing for that and pushing into ending this like this gatekeeping and making it inclusive because if we don't have that inclusivity in it we're just we're not going to solve this crisis and we can't, we have to overcome that barrier of trying to upkeep the current system that's in place. Great, thank you so much. Um, such a rich conversation on false solutions. And I really wish we had more time because this is such a, such a great panel. Don't want to let you go. Um, but we do have to wrap up shortly. So I just have one more question, which is a bit of a lightning round. Um, so you can just go ahead and jump in. Uh, but my final question is, in many ways, of course, the pandemic has been incredibly hard on people around the world. But what message of hope would you like to share with everyone watching this uh, from the Just Recovery gathering and even beyond, maybe? Um, Dominique, would you like to start? Yeah, so my message that I want people watching this to kind of come away with is that now even though we've been through such you know an incredibly hard time there is also hope in what has happened in that as mentioned before it's really exposed um the like the fabrics uh, of society and the unequal foundations and 
for a better future, we really do need to unite. Like now really is the time for a united fight of liberation. And to remember that another world is possible as long as we act and as long as we come together, the power of the people is truly monumental as we've seen in the past. Movements aren't just a thing of history. They're not just something that's happened in the past. Movements are ongoing and they're now. And as people, we all have um, such incredible power when we unite and really push uh, forward in collective action. So really take that and just remember that we do have power as people and now, now is the time. Well, I guess one thing I would just say about a hopeful note is that even though we're up against huge forces um, and a pretty firm and unyielding deadline to get our act together um, before things truly spiral out of control, um, they're pretty far out of control now, um, it's worth remembering that things are changing very quickly from a movement perspective as well. Um, you know, when I wrote uh, this Changes Everything, which came out in 2014, which was really calling for an intersectional, you know, roots up uh, a transformational approach that would really get at capitalism and, and white supremacy and center reparations in how we, 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 we respond to this crisis, building on, on work that was coming from the global south and the calls from Bolivia, Nigeria, and Ecuador for climate debt and reparations and a Marshall Plan for Planet Earth. It was treated as absolutely off the wall, you know, um, uh, in 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 mainstream circles in in the United States. I I couldn't have imagined imagined the Fridays for Future movement. I couldn't have imagined the Sunrise movement. I couldn't have imagined Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and the Squad, um, and 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 or even the or even the Bernie Sanders campaign, you know. Um, so we have to remember that we are changing too. <laughs> um, and we are, in, we're, we're, it's never fast enough that we're getting our acts together, but we are. Um, and, and I think a lot of that is, is because of Dominique's generation, just um, being so clear uh, about not wanting to, not, not being willing to accept the siloing, the compartmentalization, um, the, the, the policing of the boundaries of acceptable discourse, but insisting that we have to actually get to the root of these crises and, 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 and advance responses on the scale of the crises that we face. Um, I take heart from the fact that Hollywood has a, had us wrong. You know, every, um, we've seen so many visions of the future where things, go, things start falling apart and people come out of their homes to like eat each other's brains, right? That's the plot of every zombie movie. Well, you know, in the pandemic, people came out of their homes after months of lockdown to join Black Lives Matter demonstrations and stand up for people they don't know. So maybe we aren't quite as bad as uh, as we were told we were. Uh, um, and and uh, maybe there's a little hope in that. Well, if I, um, if I can add something to that, and especially speaking to some of the points that Hakima has made, you know, I think what the, the pandemic has provided some uh, very hopeful signs. You know, one of the real problems with the world in the past has been this uh, incredible sort of this way of thinking where it's all always about progress defined in a certain way, where some countries are thought of as advanced and some are thought of as backward. But what the COVID pandemic has shown us is that really some of the worst outcomes have come from advanced, so-called advanced countries. You know, whereas some of the best outcomes have come from uh, Africa and Asia. You know, Senegal has proved itself to be a world leader, uh, you know, in public health, and so has uh, Sierra Leone. And one of the reasons for that is simply because, uh, exactly as Hakima says, there are grassroots levels uh, approaches to these issues. I really suspect that, you know, this, uh, this is a harbinger of the future. Uh, climate change is going to up upend, uh, really, all our expectations of the world. I would say with this push that you've all mentioned to get back to normal, we really have to keep the pressure up. Um, and we can learn from the practices and experiences of women, trans and non-binary people and young people all over the world in Venezuela, Rojava, Chiapas, Jackson and Zimbabwe. Um, 
And to remember the words of June Jordan, we're not powerless, we're indispensable despite all the atrocities of state and corporate policy to the contrary. At the very least, if we can't control things, we certainly can mess them up. Thank you so much um, for that uh, final comments. Um, and I love that idea, we can't control it, but we can certainly mess it up. <laughs> That's fantastic. And uh, I hope that everyone continues to um, keep messing things up in their own way. Um, thank you so much to all the panelists for such an interesting conversation today. Like I really enjoyed it. It's been such a pleasure. And I, I really hope you've enjoyed yourselves too. And that everyone who's listening um, has enjoyed it as much as, as I have. I want to wish everyone at the gathering a really good time over the next few days and to wish everyone good health for you and your families. It's been such a tough year for so many people, but I hope conversations like this give you all hope as they certainly do for me and inspiration to keep taking action for a just recovery. So much love um, from 350 and from the Just Recovery Gathering. Thank you so much. Global Just Recovery Gathering. <laughs>